Okay, good morning. Um, you're going to find out that hands and feet are very similar here in a few minutes because uh, you're going to hear a little repetition because um, what applies a lot in, in the wrist and hand applies in the ankle and, and then you're going to see some different fractures that apply strictly around the ankle. So here we go again with growth plate anatomy and I think if you've seen this you, we, we can show it to you again. So you're looking at an ankle here, um, an ankle x-ray, and this dark line is an epiphysis, a growth plate here, the epiphysis distal to that. This is the uh, growth plate uh, of the fibula as well. So we have the two growth plates like you have in the, the radius and ulna. Here you see, again, a prototypical bone with the cartilage and the, the weak spot in, in the cartilage. And, and when people twist their ankle and get hurt, I, this is a weak point in the bone and prone to injury. So I, I think that um, we're going to go over again just quickly this Salter-Harris classification. Um, and you see here uh, the sort of shaded area is where the growth plate is uh, over here. And then you see the fracture types along the way, and the, the Salter 1 being just through the growth plate, that Salter 2 being through the growth plate and up through the metaphysis of the bone, the Salter 3 being through the epiphysis and, and the growth plate, Salter 4 crossing uh, the, both of the, uh, both the, the epiphysis and the metaphysis, and the Salter 5, which is a very difficult fracture to appreciate. And we'll, we're going to go through these in a little more detail, so I'm not trying to gloss over them. But this is really the difference, obviously, between the adolescent athlete and the growing athlete. Now, people always, you know, sometimes I see a girl who's 14 or 15, and, and you wonder, you know, they come with an ankle injury, is this a growth plate injury or not? Well, obviously, the first thing you need to do is, is take an x-ray and see if there is a growth plate open. Because once your growth plates are closed, now you're kind of into the adult uh, spectrum of injuries. Um, so here we are with the uh, type 1 pediatric ankle sprain. And I can't tell you how many times people come into my office with their parents and they've had a bad ankle for a, a week or 10 days. And their parents say, well, I sprained my ankle. My son sprained his ankle. And I go, really? Let's see. So we look at it and it really hurts, right? And the, usually the distal fibula is the source of most of these problems if you invert your ankle. And so uh, parents tend to think their kids have the same injuries and that's not true. Kids are not small adults, they're, they're, they're kids and they have different structures. So if your ankle is swollen and black and blue and there's a local tenderness in that fibula, which is again the most common spot, then that's not an ankle sprain. And the emergency room, fortunately, is pretty good at this. Sometimes they show up in the emergency room and they, they usually say, well, we can't tell for sure. You need to go see an orthopedist. And they can't tell, but if you push on that spot and on the x-ray there's an open growth plate, and that's obviously an important feature, that's broken. And so it's, it's not sort of broken, it's not sprained, it's broken. And so, and, and, and then comes usually the next question, when can he play football? And I go, it's broken, you don't get it. <laughs> um, so, you know, it doesn't mean you go in a cast and then run down the field. It means you're on crutches or you can walk on these. These are stable fractures. It's not like they're unstable and gonna fall apart, but they sure hurt. And, and kids usually tell you better than their parents. They go, I can't play. What do you mean you can't play? You, you know, you're the star of the team and dad's the coach. You know, that doesn't work so well. Um, so it really needs to be immobilized. This is a fracture. In the old days, before the advent of removable casts, we put on a hard cast and it was broken. Um, but today, it's got, we kind of almost make it a little less important. We put on removable casts, which are nice because you can wash, but it really is broken. And, and I tell people it needs to stay on, and that's when we start negotiating usually. The good news about this is it, does, it heals pretty uneventfully. So it heals up fine, it just needs time. And usually the day you come out of the cast isn't the day you play three soccer games on the weekend. You need to take it a little easy, get the ankle loosened up, and then you go back to sports. So this is a very common injury, and again, parents sometimes don't get it. Then, then they come in and they get it and they usually beat themselves up about why they should have been here sooner. And then, then we get on to the next sort of level of injury. And as we go up this, this grade of Salter injuries, the, the problems can be bigger and bigger in terms of future growth. And any time you tell a parent, well, there's a growth plate injury, they get really nervous. They go, is it going to grow? 
And in that salty one, which is again one of the more common ones, the answer is that rarely causes a problem. Now as you get into some of these higher levels, this Salter II, which we talked about, that goes through the growth plate and then up through the metaphysis, this is where you really can injure the growth plate. Because at this, I'd like to be able to use that pointer. Oh, here we go. So at this level right here, where that broke away from the growth plate, you can actually have a growth arrest right in the central portion here, and that can cause a problem. So especially in displaced Salter twos, there are non-displaced fractures, but when you see a gap like that, you run some risk of having a growth arrest in the past, in the future, sorry. And so the, the general uh, concept in fixing growth plate injuries is an anatomic reduction. We want to put it back virtually line to line to prevent future growth problems. So we try to put it back line to line surgically in cases where they're displaced like this. Occasionally we'll do a close reduction, but nowadays most of these are fixed with screws and plates and things like that. And the concept is if you can put it back line to line, you reduce the chance of a growth, in, uh, a growth arrest in the future. So this is the Salter II injury. Again, a fairly common injury. Uh, as we go up again in these grades, they become less common. So Salter IIs are pretty common. Now we get into uh, the Salter III classification. This is a fracture not just through the growth plate, but then through the epiphysis, through, so through that, uh, that uh, secondary ossification center. Um, this is usually a higher energy injury. Um, we're going to talk about a specific ankle one in a minute, but this is a higher energy injury. This usually, if, it's, if there's any displacement, it requires fixing it. And, and the, the, so the concept here is if you're going to fix it, you try to stay away from putting hardware across the growth plate because that does definitely uh, increase your risk of growth disturbances. If you are going to put something across the growth plate, you want to make it a smooth pin, not a big screw, because that's not a good idea. So growth arrests in this injury are a bit more common. And so here's a special version of this Salter III injury, and this has a, a name called the Tillot fracture. And this fracture occurs as growth is ending. And the reason that happens, uh, as you see over here, you see the growth plate is absent uh, going from the medial side of the ankle uh, about three quarters of the way across, because the ankle growth plate closes from medial to lateral as you're, as you're growing. What you're left with is a bit of open growth plate, and you see here what happens. Um, this ligament, as you twist your ankle, pulls that open growth plate apart. And, and so this is a Tillot fracture. And this is a, a special type of ankle fracture that occurs again toward the end of growth. And as you see here, the treatment is to fix it. And the treatment is to fix it primarily because the, the joint surface is gapped like that. The growth is closing, so this rarely causes any significant growth disturbance in the bone, but it's a special kind of fracture that occurs at the end of growth, so that we see occasionally. When you get into the Salter IV classification, now this is one that causes a little more potential for growth disturbance. It's broken now across the, both the, there we go, broken across, as you see here in this diagram, through the epiphysis, through the growth plate, then up through the metaphysis. And again, uh, the principle applies again. You don't want to put hardware across the growth plate. So what you see here, the way you fix that, is you put individual screws in, different, in the piece. But remember, this is one big piece here. So you, you try not to cross that. It's tempting to throw a couple of screws there, but that's not a good idea. So screw in the epiphysis, screw in the metaphysis, and it heals up pretty uneventfully. Still a relatively high incidence of growth disturbance um, that can be a future problem. Salter V, this is the tough one. Um, these we sometimes don't even realize they've occurred. This is a compression injury of that growth plate. You see the growth plate here and you get a suggestion that something's happened here. There's a little fleck of bone at the growth plate, but not a clear cut fracture here. And a compression injury this is a very high likelihood of causing growth plate disturbance because you've crushed the growth plate. The problem is you can't tell it often for, for months down the line and you can get a real surprise when somebody comes back a year later and, and the, the, they have an angulatory deformity of their ankle uh, because you miss this along the way. It's, it's not hard to miss. 
And so there's a, then you get into a, a very complicated ankle fracture called the triplane fracture that again occurs uh, during growth. Um, this is a fracture that requires a, a CAT scan to really understand the fracture because these fractures are quite complex. And as you see from, it's probably kind of small up there, but if you see from the middle uh, film, if I can get this to work again, um, you see a number of fracture lines through this. And one of the hallmarks of this fracture is that in the, the front on view, it looks like a Salter three but in the lateral view, it actually is more complicated. It's got at least a Salter II component and even a Salter, uh, a Salter IV component here. So you really need a CAT scan and then you need to plan these out with individual treatment for every fracture because these, these triplane fractures are bad fractures that need, heal, need uh, really careful planning preoperatively. They often uh, uh, result in growth plate injuries. Uh, and disturbances. And this is the end result of a growth plate arrest. And what you wind up seeing here is that instead of the ankle being plantar grade and parallel to the, uh, the floor, the, this bone has stopped growing, the fibulas continued to grow, and now you have this angulation of the ankle joint requiring complex surgery with osteotomy, uh, often requiring us to stop the growth in this fibula with uh, staples and or other techniques. Um, the, this is what we're trying to avoid and we're trying to identify and let people know about if it's, if it's, it's that kind of fracture that could cause this. Um, this. This requires fairly extensive surgery at some point. So with that, thank you. And um, we, I think we're gonna take questions on both the ankle and the, and the